John and Ken show. John Cobell and Ken Shampo. I was thinking if there's a way with the Internet to match up drivers who are in a hurry with pregnant women. That'd be great. You know, and you can pay the pregnant woman to sit in your car, and then you can drive 100 miles an hour, and then when the cop pulls you over, it's like, hey, my wife, she's pregnant. I mean, I, I just, there's a and business somewhere. And you can do it in the carpool in. lane. Yeah, exactly. You go 100 miles an hour in the carpool lane with a pregnant woman, and the woman just rents herself out to fill uh, fill your seat. There's the a business water there. Until the water mess. breaks. <laughs> do you have to prove the water breaks? I don't know. John and Ken show. KFI yeah, you pour a couple on the seat. There you go. <laughs> All right, this hour, Jerry Brown is going to talk to the state workers. He's actually holding a huge statewide teleconference town hall with just the state workers. It has been sponsored by the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, and we got producer Ray listening in, so if there's any gems, you can just imagine. <laughs> the whored out Jerry Brown is going to talk to his benefactors this hour. <laughs> Is he doing an hour of taxpayers only? People yeah. who are really these tapped are, out? No. These are, this is a uh, this is a parasites crawling over the taxpayer cadaver here. Now, how, how many times the media pundits like George Skelton with the L.A. Times try to tell you that the wise Jerry Brown can be tough with the public employee unions? Don't believe no. it. They are his whore masters. <laughs> they are. He. You know what? He didn't. He didn't get any breaks out of the unions. He's got two contracts he's negotiated, and the unions rolled them both times. If you can't get some major union concessions when you're $26 billion in debt and your tax plan just blew up? Even some of the windbag pundits are finally waking up and saying, oh, this idea for pension reform he introduced last yeah. week, it's you baloney, notice, it's phony, it's, it's nothing, it's playing at the margins, it's not going to solve the problem. Do you notice there's not one micro-inch of, 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 a, of, a, of a compromise coming from the unions? They're signing contracts. They're getting everything they want. They're getting extra benefits. And we're still supposed to feel sorry and, and pay more in taxes? We're not that stupid. I'm telling you, the tide is turning. We're not that stupid anymore. It's we're the not we're not fall. that stupid tour. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's gonna. We're not that stupid. All right, we're we're gonna, fairly stupid, but not that stupid. We're going to talk to the Orange County District Attorney, Tony Rakakis. He got our attention because he, along with the Orange County Board of Supervisors, have decided to do even more about registered sex offenders. And we're talking about banning them from uh, parks and beaches. we got to learn the particulars of this uh apparent ordinance, which has been approved by the Orange County Board of Supervisors. So let's get him on the show and talk about it. Hey, Tony. Well, you're a government uh, worker, Tony. Tony, you got any any complaining? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We're, uh, yes, I'm, I'm a government worker. I'm an elected uh, government official. Yeah, you unhappy so about anything? The point of that is, at least if we don't like how much you're making and what you're doing, you can be thrown out of office. That's what? right. And uh, I, I would expect that. What was the impetus for this idea to ban the sex offenders from the beaches and the harbors and the wilderness? The wilderness. Well, back a little bit, <laughs> back a little bit over a year ago uh, in uh, in Fullerton, we had uh, a, uh, a multiple sex offender who was uh, uh, living uh, close to uh, one of the parks in uh, Fullerton, uh, close to a recreation area in Fullerton, and. Uh, we realized uh, after a lot of complaints from neighbors and uh, and people who lived in the area and and, uh, and parents that there really wasn't anything we could do about just keeping them out of the park. Uh, that uh, that that well, wasn't uh, that the, that the law didn't uh, didn't really allow for that. And you know, as long as it's not a condition of somebody's uh, uh, probation or parole, uh, that uh, then uh, there was no particular law uh, to do that. So what I, I guess we should is, be clear here that the sex offenders can't live within 2,000 feet of a school or park, but that doesn't stop them from walking around in a park. That's exactly right. The uh, residency requirement doesn't stop them from going into a park or, or hanging out at the beach and looking at the kids and, and uh, you know, being over in the, next to the playgrounds and that sort of thing. So uh, it was really, it's, it's, it's a gap, and we need to develop a safety zone for the kids, and that's what we're doing here. How would this work exactly? Well, it, it's, a, it's a misdemeanor for a registered sex offender now uh, in Orange County to uh, to uh, enter a, a park or a uh, place where children regularly gather, uh, and we have those listed, uh, what the parks are and, and where they are. And uh, so if somebody's there and uh, 
uh, you know, would, uh, uh, for whatever reason, develop their or you know gain the attention of the authorities. Certainly, maybe the parents or whatever sit, you know might be there leering at the kids or whatnot, and um, they could be uh, uh, identified and and. Uh, so if, um, if mom sees a creepy guy, they she he can call she can call the police, and the police uh, can investigate him. And if he's on the Megan's list, then he's uh, arrested for a misdemeanor. That he's in violation, right? And he could be arrested for a misdemeanor. Does this go for yeah. all parks and beaches in Orange County? Are there exceptions? Uh, well, it's it's all of the uh, parks and other places of recreation in Orange County where children regularly gather. That's a requirement that, uh, that it has to be a place where children regularly gather. So, uh, you know, like where uh, a park where they have, uh, you know, where the kids uh, meet and play or playgrounds, uh, you know, things of that nature. And apparently they can get written permission, though, in order to still enter the park. Is there an exception to this? Yes, the, the exception is that they can go to the sheriff's department and uh, ask the sheriff for written permission uh, to uh, enter the park for whatever their particular reason might be, and it'll be uh, up to the sheriff to develop uh, criterion for that, and they're working on that now. So, so if there's example, a, a family, uh, family party maybe at the park and they want to attend? Well, it could be that, or it could be somebody working, maybe, maybe working in the park uh, on, a, on some, you know, making a road or whatever it might be, uh, and they have some legitimate reason to be there, then, of course, that would be allowed. Isn't part of the reason for this, too, just to make Orange County more uncomfortable for sex offenders to live in the first place, which I think is actually a good idea? Well, the, the, the reason is to uh, have a safety area for the kids where there's a buffer. The kids don't have to be subjected to the presence of uh, sex offenders. And, the, you know, if the parents could feel more comfortable, the kids could, uh, uh, could play without uh, concern about, uh, about, being, uh, about being molested. And if it does make uh, uh, sex offenders uncomfortable about being uh, uh, in our uh, county or in our areas, then uh, that's fine, too. Any uh, any sex offenders object? <laughs> Is there uh, like yes, a sex a offenders fact. lobby? Uh, well, we we did have a uh, person who spoke to the board today who uh, uh, was uh, objecting to the law. Who was a uh, UCLA graduate, in fact, but uh, uh, as it turns out, had uh, a uh, conviction of uh, possession of child porn. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, this is this Laguna Beach resident, Jeffrey McBride, who said this is unconscionable, unconstitutional, and it was pointed out by one of the Orange County supervisors that he's on the Megan's Law website possessing obscene <laughs> matter depicting a minor. Right, well, so he was, uh, I suppose, representing the uh, the sex offenders and the and the child porn possessors in objecting to this law. Do you think this, this is going to face a lawsuit? Of course. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there'll be a lawsuit. We've we've looked at it uh, pretty carefully, though, and we don't believe that there's any uh, any constitutional problem. And and uh, as long as we have uh, fair um, a fair discretion when when it comes to granting the permission, I think we're I think we're in pretty good shape here. All right, Orange County District Attorney Tony Rukakis, thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, we'll talk more about this when we come back. But I compare this really what Arizona tried to do last year concerning illegal aliens. I mean, they passed a bill, Senate Bill 1070, and eventually courts struck down a number of provisions. But I think the message was clear. Don't make this a nice environment for illegal aliens. And in this case, don't make Orange County a nice environment for sex offenders. Because you know how the rules work. They get paroled back to where they committed the crime or where they have family or whatever. So you really don't have any choice about the sex offenders coming to live in Orange County again. But if you pass laws like this, you can make them uncomfortable enough that maybe they'll hit the road. We like hostile environments. We're going to be on Channel 5 in seconds here. John and Ken, KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. Quite a, an attractive guy at the beach, by the way. What a novel idea that my skin actually matches the color of my T-shirt. White socks, uh, tennis shoes from Costco, and two pairs of glasses. Man, if you uh, want to be just single and never have sex again in your life, try this act. This is how, you, how, how to roll. Tim Conway Jr. Tonight at 7. KFI AM 64. Oh, John and Ken Show rolls on here. John Cobalt and Ken Shampoo. Less than 20 minutes. We'll be back on Channel 5 KTLA to talk more with Micah about the great news of the day. Yeah, we're also tracking Jerry Brown, who this very hour is doing a teleconference town hall with the state workers. Seriously. So how's this working exactly? The Service Employees International Union has organized. Well, I, I would imagine there's a number that you can call. 
and you'll be on the line with Jerry Brown, and then everyone else can hear you. I mean, if you're picked to go on with them, and I guess so, so can, everybody... there's a website you can go to, one of the California government websites, because Ray is listening to it right now. Okay, so it, it's it's not be taking place in a, in an auditorium of any kind. No, that's why it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a teleconference. Right. I didn't know if he was on the big screen on stage. No, my but feeling you is you can watch it. Your... You can listen to it on the internet. If you want to call in, there's probably a phone number so you can actually be on the line with Jerry Brown talking about your issues. That's what I'm. Guessing. Oh man, you know what? Taxpayers should get in on this then. Yeah, I don't why, know if we have why, the number. We have the announcement, but maybe the number is only being circulated by the union or, or the way to get involved. I, I would be, it would be great if if taxpayers would crash this parasite fest. I uh, let me just look at the press release. I Change the I terms of the debate, huh? What? That would be great. <laughs> I would imagine they thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess so too. Yeah. But uh, it would be great if somebody hacked their way into the conversation and yeah. said, uh, Jerry Brown, why do you only meet with the Whoremasters? <laughs> well, you have to say the Whoremasters part in a really deep voice. <laughs> That's right. If anybody can break in and ask Jerry Brown as to why he only meets with the Whoremasters, we'll, uh, we'll make you a star if you can pull that off. We're finding out more and more information about uh, Southwest Airlines and, of course, the scare last week, uh, Friday. That plane that took off from Phoenix on its way to Sacramento had to make an emergency landing because there was a hole in the roof. And now we're finding out that that particular plane that had the gash open in the fuselage had made an average of seven flights a day over its 15 years of service. Holy crap. Yeah, well, that's what they said yesterday. Southwest really works its planes hard in that they do a lot of short routes. So the planes are constantly taking off and landing, which clearly... Uh, from the uh, perspective so the, of the air pressure and cabin pressure, puts right. a lot of stress on the plane's fuselage. You and have to pressurize a, the plane over right, and over, over again. again and, right. and so they run they run probably twice as many flights as uh, long-distance air carriers would run. So it's almost as if this plane has been pl- flying for 30 years, not 15. Right, exactly right. So that would lead to a lot of stress on it. And as we mentioned before, you know, they do an inspection Visible, visible inspection, and then every now and then they actually tear the plane apart and look at it more closely, but they didn't do that often enough in the case of this plane to detect what had become a real problem and that it uh, tore open. Well, how intense is that visual inspection? They just take a look at it? Do you see anything? Well, they, I, don't I don't see, see anything. anything. You? you? Got a beer? <laughs> yeah, I, I, the word I'm getting is that they can't be certain that it's a real danger unless they're actually doing that inspection where they tear the plane apart and look more closely at it to see exactly whether or not the stress fractures, what they're calling them, could be a real problem. Didn't they uh, find five other planes with these kind of fractures? Yeah, today? they did. That's right. They did find yeah. a number of other planes with these same kind of fractures. So, uh, uh, Is it a lot to ask that a <laughs> hole doesn't get blown in the roof when you're flying on a plane? I mean, I don't know how long it takes to do these inspections, but can you do them? Well, you know, John, the airlines aren't making any money these days. Uh, yeah, I know. And that's uh, that's where, and I, I think that is why. And Southwest the, has been the, one of the few success stories yeah. because they've been able to compete right. with pretty good service and low cost. But one of the things they're doing in this is putting those planes in the air way too often All over right. their lifetime. I'm not in the airline business, right? Right. And you aren't either. But doesn't it make sense that if you're lifting off and landing twice as often as most other planes, that because of the pressurization issue, you're going to have cracks more often? And so maybe you should do this full inspection twice a year instead of once a year or whatever the uh, schedule is. Ah, but that'll cost they more should... money, won't it? Well, yeah. And but... that will lead to more planes being <laughs> out of service because they have to have that thorough inspection yeah. more often. Hey, I didn't ask you to run, to, to run an airline. You decided to run an airline. And this, so you, you know, you have to figure this this problem out over how much it costs and how often your planes are going to be out of service because you own the airline. And I don't care about your problems. I just don't want a hole sucking me out of out of my seat. If it's about the pressurization, is it kind of like where do you blow up a balloon fifty times over and finally it just gives out? It pops. Yeah, in a way, it's sort it of wears like out. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because it, it it wears on the fuselage and then you start to get cracks. And now they're finding cracks on other, these other Southwest planes. So it kind of all makes sense. I don't think this is complicated. 
If you have that many pressurizations, then the cracks are going to appear sooner. Yeah, and I had wondered why Southwest, for the second time in two years, had this problem with the hole in the fuselage. But now, when you look at all the stories about them and how often they run their planes on these short routes, it kind of makes sense. And you're right, the, John. The, in the end, they're going to have to do more maintenance-wise to make sure that they don't have and, another hole in the sucker. And they're a young airline. And they're an unusual airline because they have so many short hops, especially in California. I mean, California is really suited to be Southwest base that this is a problem that maybe other airlines have never encountered before because they've never had a business model like Southwest does, where they have many, many flights, many short hops, constant pressurization. Uh, You know, it's not like they've been doing this for 50 years. Maybe after 15 years, this, you know, the problems start appearing. So now the FAA is ordering all the airlines to conduct details inspections within five days of the older model, Boeing 737, 300s, 400s, and 500s, that have logged more than 35 flight cycles. That's how they they refer to it. So this is going to cause problems for all the airlines, not just Southwest, because the FAA is ordering them to take a little bit more of a closer look at whether or not there's a lot of stress going on with the fuselage. All right, when we come back... It's a great word, isn't it? Fuselage. Who got a bloody pig's foot in the mail? Hmm. (laughs) This is a great story. We didn't, but somebody we've talked about did. And then we'll be on with Channel 5. That's right. A former guest on our show got a bloody pig's foot. He's been on our show a number of times, actually. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We'll be on with Channel 5 in about 10 minutes. John and Ken Show. John Cobelt and Ken Shampoo. We're going to be back on Channel 5 in less than five minutes. In a moment, we'll tell you about who got a bloody pig's foot in the mail, but in a story that can't get any worse, there's one more small twist to the beating of the Giants fan, the paramedic Brian Stowe, after the Dodger home opener last Thursday night. They're still looking for the two thugs that beat him unconscious and even kicked him while he was on the ground. Believe it or not, this twist today, minutes before he was beaten up in the Dodger Stadium parking lot. Brian Stowe texted a relative to say he feared for his safety. In the text message, he said he was scared inside the stadium, his cousin John Stowe said, adding, and he doesn't use that term loosely. A short time later when the game ended, the paramedic and father of two walked out to look for a taxi and was attacked so brutally he remains in a coma with a brain injury. Severely fractured skull and damage to the frontal lobe of his brain. And probably you know about that story by now, but that's another twist where he was already telling well, yeah. people he and knew that this is not safe. It's what we've discussed for the last two days. We're getting a lot of emails. We had a number of phone calls on it. We could probably talk about this for hours. The fear that people feel inside Dodger Stadium that didn't exist even five years ago. Something changed. And, and I'm telling you, they're marketing towards... The, uh, the the gang culture they are because wow. those guys those guys are willing to buy a lot of food and a lot of drink and they like to wear the colors. Somebody wrote to us yesterday that that uh, you know, th- there's there's an, uh, 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 some sort of uh, affectation for the color blue among a lot of these gangs. And that really is a color thing that we're blue and the giants are, are orange. Black, yeah. black, orange and black, and that, that there's a lot of Southern California gangs that have uh, an emotional connection to the color blue. I don't know if this well, is the true or not. The Bloods were red and blue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. So, I mean, we're dealing with the most primitive form of, of, of human behavior, where they, they form a tribe, they have a team color, and so the Dodgers now represent an extension of their gang life, and they bring their whole gang culture to the stadium. I mean, I mean, the, these guys are no good to society at all. All they do is create mayhem in their lives on their streets. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they got they got rap sheets. They're violent. They're doing drug deals. And then the stadium going to the Dodgers is just another outlet for them. I learned a long time ago not to wear any opposing team's garb to somebody else's home stadium. I just don't do it because I don't even like the taunting. I find it really stupid because... Well, I like sports, and I might invest in a team that I really enjoy watching, and when I'm home on my TV set, you know, I get worked up. But I would never go to a stadium, even my home stadium, and see a guy with a jersey on from the other team and just start taunting him. I just can't. I don't know what that is. What's that brain mechanism? These are people that are just, what, they have small penises? They're primitive. What's, what's the matter with them? They're, they're primitives. It's the most basic form of I mean, when their team is ahead, they stand up. And, I mean, I see this all the time. Yeah. I've never oh, seen yeah. a beating, but I've seen guys, you know, stand up and point at the other guy. Ah, 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 
hey, ho, look at your team blows. Yeah. I'm like, what? I don't really get that. You're dealing with, uh, you know, the room temperature IQs is what you're dealing with. Basic primitive behavior. I have a tribe. This is my color. This is the name of my tribe. I great. You, I'm great. You stink. That's, that's as far as they think. All right. And then they got all the testosterone and adrenaline and booze in their system. We're going to go on with Channel 5 KTLA News and anchor Michael Ullman now to talk about the issues of the day in the big news issue bags. So let's see what's in there. Time now to drive it home with KFI AM 640's John and Ken. We join them live on KFI. Ken in studio, John on location. Guys, bathrooms at L.A. County beaches will be closed more often this summer, actually beginning uh, next month. Fewer workers to clean the restrooms. It's, it's another ploy by government. This time it's the L.A. County government trying to make the average taxpayer who is not a tax taker, is just a taxpayer, feel the pain over all the budget deficits. I mean, there is so much money. The L.A. County Board of Supervisors, each one of them has like a $3 million slush fund that they can spend any way they want to. In fact, we talked about one of the supervisors, Mark Ridley Thomas, a couple of years ago, who wanted to uh, have a $1 million makeover of his office. So they have all this money. And then they turn to us and they say, well, you know what? Some of the bathrooms just won't be open when you're looking for them. Or they'll open later in the day. If you need a bathroom before 11 a.m., you may be out of luck because we've got a budget crunch. What can we do about it but cut back on the number of people cleaning the bathrooms? It's total garbage. Do you tell your five-year-old when you're at the beach at 10 o'clock in the morning that uh, I can't take you to the bathroom now because they don't have the money for a maintenance worker? This is nonsense. We're spending a billion and a half dollars a year in L.A. County on illegal alien health care. And the five county supervisors, and everybody should call these five up all day and night about this. Yaroslavsky, Molina, Kanabe, Antonovich, and Ridley Thomas. Each one of them has $3 million a year. Some of them have accumulated tens of millions of dollars in these private supervisor accounts, which is basically a slush fund to spend on whatever they want or repay any favors. It's an and emotional it's, it's, it's political nonsense. ploy. He's exactly right. It's an emotional political ploy to get people to feel the pain more directly. It's like the same stunt they pulled a couple of years ago by telling us, well, the DMV offices are going to be closed on Fridays because of furlough Fridays. What else can we do? It's a dire state crisis. You wouldn't believe how much waste and unnecessary spending there is at all levels of government from the county up to the state. And yet when they have a budget crisis, do they lay off people? Do they cut back? Do they decrease the size of the government? No. They want to turn around and make you feel the pain on a level that you might understand, like the restrooms at the beaches, so they can grab more of your tax money. This is what they do. This is what they try to do over and over again. And we're one of the few shows that tries to point that out to people, that they're just trying to manipulate you. Yeah, a five-year-old's got to go when a five-year-old's got to yeah, go. That's right. Well, they don't want to hear about it. Why can't they leave the restrooms open if they're a little bit dirty? So what? But, I mean, they have well, to close them completely? They're kind of dirty and stinky anyway much of the time. I don't know how much cleaning is going on. I mean, though the, the, the public restroom at uh, the public tennis courts that I use on the west side is disgusting and is usually vagrants sitting in there washing their underwear in the sink. So I don't know how much money is being spent on these restrooms to begin with. All right, let's talk about what's happening up north. Philip Garrido, the man accused of imprisoning and raping J.C. Dugard for 18 years. Apparently, according to his lawyer, he's going to plead guilty on Thursday. Well, I don't think that's according to his lawyer, Mike. Uh, I think this is an interesting twist. It's according to Nancy Garrido's lawyer, Stephen Tapson. Stephen Tapson has been babbling to the media now for weeks about the deals that are on the table for both Phil and Nancy, his client. And the reason he's doing this is he's trying to get a better deal from the district attorney's office. But Nancy Garrido was a willing participant in the abduction of J.C. In fact, she grabbed her into the car. She got a chance back in 1993 when Phil Garrido was in jail for 42 days to do something about J.C. Lee Dugard being a captive of that family and didn't. Tapson is doing this, believe it or not, to elicit sympathy from the prospective jury pool up there in that county, so hopefully, in the end, she doesn't end up with 180 years in prison, which is what she deserves. Yeah, Phil Garrido has no case. He's confessed to the crime. The only flimsy defense he tried for about five minutes is to say, I'm insane, but he's not. He's evil. And then Nancy Garrido, she's got no case either. They start showing the videos that she shot of, uh, of uh, getting a five-year-old girl to bend over so uh, they could run the tape and entertain Phil late at night. 
She's done. She's the one with her hands who grabbed uh, J.C. Dugard. They don't, they don't have to negotiate with uh, Nancy Garrido or Garrido's attorney. They don't. The prosecution could just sit there and say, fine, you want a trial? Have at it. Let's, let's, see, uh, let's see a group of citizens uh, have mercy on Nancy Garrido for what she did to J.C. Yeah, the lawyer's claiming happen. that a plea deal would benefit his wife's case, Nancy Garrido, by showing the major evil person is out of the way. Those are the words of the lawyer. Well, they need They're, to both be out of the way. She They're was, both evil. Oh, yeah, absolutely. She's a major accessory to this case. Can you imagine a small child is kidnapped and you do nothing about it? I don't know if you help kidnap her. Just because she didn't participate in the direct sexual assaults of J.C. Lee Dugard does not mean she's just as culpable as... Oh, so, if, if, I'll tell you, you what. Sh- he can be in jail for life and beyond when he dies, and she can just be in jail till when she dies, and then we'll take her out of jail and bury her. That's a good deal for her. That's a compromise. I like that. But we have to leave him in the cell until he's dust. Yeah, until he's his bones, yeah. All right, That's guys. John and Ken justice. <laughs> we'll leave it there. John right. and Ken, thank you. Back at you tomorrow. All, All right. right. That's our nightly simulcast with KTLA News and anchor Michael Ullman. All right. When we come back, as promised, we'll tell you who got a bloody pig's foot in the mail. <laughs> John and Ken, KFI AM640, more stimulating talk radio. KFI News, deeper than the headlines. KFI AM640, more stimulating talk radio. Talk radio. John and Ken Show, John Cobell and Ken Shampoo. All right, as promised, a bloody pig's foot. You don't get a story with... like this often. Yeah, just the words. And, and an anti-Semitic note were addressed to Congressman Peter King. You know, the day before the Japan earthquake... We talked a lot, this is March 10th, about Peter King, because he was holding those hearings. He is chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, and he was talking about the radicalization of some American Muslims. And apparently that raised a firestorm of protest. It was politically incorrect. It was wrong-headed. But he went ahead and held his day-long meetings anyway. And now we get word that they intercepted a package that was addressed to Congressman Peter King that, yes, had a bloody pig's foot and a derogatory message inside. In fact, Politico, the website, has more details that the letter was a rambling type of message conveying anti-Semitic sentiments. At one point, it referred to Congressman King as a Jew, although he's Catholic. And somewhere in the message, it says, all the babies in America will be named Muhammad. The letter also says, you can kiss my black Muslim ass. So when I read that, I have the feeling that this is by, like, a white supremacist nutball who's probably completely confused on this or doesn't really... Because, I, yeah, uh, because Muslims aren't supposed to uh, deal with the pig. They're not allowed to eat pork. Well, I can't tell you how many times we've talked about sure. certain Muslim issues and emailers tell us all that does. Oh, send them pigs or, you know, uh, spread uh, pig blood on the ground or whatever. Spe- right. You that s- was like, send- the, the, remember the, the uh, Ground Zero Mosque? That was what people right. said. Right. If you wanted to offend a Muslim, you'd send him a bloody pig's foot. But this guy sent a bloody pig's foot to Peter King. Which doesn't make is, sense. Which doesn't make sense. And then included anti-Semitic ramblings. Which would indicate that they don't like Jews, yet well, the pig's foot n- seems like they don't like most. I don't get it. I didn't well, get it. He's, the guy's nuts. I mean, this is this is like our email. I mean, this is just just crazy people. Did you see what Ibrahim Hooper, the National Communications Director for the Council on American Islamic Relations, care said? He said that they usually get pig themed hate messages, including letters smeared with bacon. <laughs> There's a twist. <laughs> What are people doing? I don't know. Who, who smears a letter with bacon and then sends it out to the guy from Care? <laughs> what a bunch of lunatics. All so right. he thinks that it was an anti-Muslim bigot, and bigots not being brain surgeons, they probably got their signals crossed. Yeah, it's very bizarre. A couple of things to tell you about, too. Uh, the San Francisco Giants have announced plans to honor the paramedic Brian Stowe, who was beaten up by the uh, Latino thugs at Dodger Stadium after the home opener. Uh, they're going to dedicate Monday's game against the Dodgers to Brian Stowe. They're going to collect donations from fans. They're also going to make an initial contribution of ten grand to the Brian Stowe Fund. Is this a hate crime since it's two Latino thugs who uh, well, beat a white guy almost to death? That's the, that's the point I was trying to make about uh, Councilman Tom LaBonge, who said it's a hate crime because it was about colors. And not race colors. It was about team colors. Team colors. Yeah, it shows you what a what an idiot he is. I thought that was it's bizarre. not about the uniform colors. How about it's two uh, two Hispanic guys beat up a white guy? How about that? Is there anybody standing up for the uh, white guy who's uh, brain damaged now because of the uh, the gang thugs? 
who beat him up? Yeah, you don't hear any talk about that. Can you imagine those two white guys who beat up a black guy or a Hispanic guy? Oh, there'd be a, you'd have Xavier right. Slavsky all the news conference. About, oh, you're absolutely oh, yeah, right. That's right. Tony Villar would be standing there claiming the outrage over this, this horrible hate crime. These men were only beaten up because they were Latino by a racist imagine white a, man. Uh, right. Not because if a gay guy were... got hit, if a, if, a, if a Jewish guy got beat up by uh, by somebody, Zev would be holding a press conference denouncing anti-Semitic hatred. All right, we told but a white you guy gets beaten, nothing. That this hour is a teleconference between Jerry Brown and the state workers, and I actually took a look at it. You could go online to this website and watch Jerry Brown sitting there at a desk with a union leader taking phone call questions from state <laughs> workers. We're going to play one <laughs> clip for you so you can get an idea of this. We'll probably have more on this tomorrow. The question is, if there is still a budget problem in November, will you proceed to furloughs or layoffs? Well, wow. Wow. Uh, you know what? I haven't thought about that. But uh, Oh, really? It, it's what? not good. Let me put it that way. Um, I wow. was able, in the Attorney General's office, to avoid layoffs. Yeah, sure. And we avoided it because we, we, we had other funding sources. Uh, we bring lawsuits. We win legal settlements. And uh, all I can tell you at this what? point... Um, there's a lot. I'm not taking anything off the table, uh, but we just have to get those tax extensions. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because ah! the, the, <laughs> the alternative uh, is not pretty. That's all I can say. Not pretty for state workers and not very nice at all for local uh, right. local people as well. Doesn't that show uh, you, though, what, exactly, uh, again, where his interests lie? <laughs> yeah, oh, lay off. Don't workers. even say the word. Oh, they were shocked. Let alone that, the private is sector a... has un undergone millions what? of layoffs <laughs> nationwide over the past several years, but not my precious state union workers. I, I fought it when I was DA. Yeah. Who's the woman who was sitting next to him? That's a, a union leader for the SEIU. She went, wow, oh, yeah, over the idea of layoffs? Like, yeah, that can't be happening. I'm not hearing oh. that. Oh, <sighs> Jesus well, we got to play that again tomorrow. We will. That shows uh, you what we're up all... against. All right. Well, look who's oh, man. almost sitting here. That Tim Conway Jr. character is in the room. He's got his show coming up next. Hey, wow. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, Tom Green is coming on tonight. Remember Drew Barrymore's uh, husband? You know, I wonder what happened to him. Well, at what does he do now? That's what I'm going to ask him oh, for okay. an hour. What happened? <laughs> What happened? His what career happened? kind of crumbled, I thought. <laughs> he's, he's not dead. No, he's not dead. All right. Uh, and the latest on what's going on at uh, Dodger Stadium. Plus, uh, sex offenders have been barred from Orange County beaches. Yeah, how great how is that? that huh? So you can't go anymore? Yeah. The, and, and, and Los Angeles, you, can, you have to be a sex offender to go to the beach. So, <laughs> a little different. It's a different rule, yeah. yeah. All right, Tim Conway Thanks. coming up in minutes. Aaron Bender has the news. See you tomorrow. John and Ken, KFI, AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. Tuesday, April 5th. Hang on. They can't start the news till I say KFI. Los Angeles, Orange County, County. News on the hour, on the half, and when it breaks. The investigation awakens. I'm Aaron Bender. The LAPD says it is looking for information on seven missing women who have been linked to the Grim Sleeper serial murder case. Their photos were found in the South L.A. home of Lonnie Franklin Jr., who's already charged with ten of the serial murders. LAPD Detective Dennis Kilcoin says he's particularly concerned about three women whose photos were found in one part of Franklin's home. These photos were also accompanied with photos of our 2007 victims. These seven women haven't been seen in years. They spent time in Franklin's neighborhood. An eighth woman, a known murder victim, may also be connected with the case. Kilcoin says right now there isn't enough evidence to prove it. At LAPD headquarters, Eric Leonard, KFI News. LAPD detectives say there is evidence the Dodger fans who attacked a Giants fan opening day attacked some kids first. They say witnesses say they saw the two guys hit a few boys dressed in Giants gear, but the kids never reported it. Brian Stowe is still in a coma at USC Medical Center. It's very hard to say what the prognosis is. It's really too early at this point. He does remain in critical condition. Dr. Gabriel Zada says they'll know more in the next week or so. Stowe's skull was cracked. Police say they are working a lot of leads to catch the two guys accused of attacking Stowe.